Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, I know it's the last talk of OpenJS World, so give your ra everybody a round of applause for making it this far. Um, I quickly just want to thank everybody that made this happen. So everybody that's behind the scenes, um, it's awesome that we can come all the way here and I still see familiar faces, which is great, and some new faces. Um, and yeah, if you want to follow along or you want the slides, there's a QR code there. Um, if the link doesn't work, let me know. Uh, there's also a bit.ly link there as well. Um, if you still use bit.ly, you like it or you don't. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the future of JavaScript package management. And hopefully most people here care a little bit about JavaScript and, and package management in some sense. Um, hopefully that's why you're here. Um, give you a little bit of insight about who I am. My name is Darcy Clark. I've worked with a lot of uh, brands, big, big names uh, in uh, my tenure as an engineer. Um, I've also most recently worked at GitHub. Uh, we were acquired uh, via NPM uh, acquisition in 2020. So worked very closely with and, and managed the NPM CLI team as well as the GitHub CLI teams at GitHub. Um, and I also uh, co-founded a company called Themify. Anybody ever do any WordPress work in their lives? Yes, some of you, hopefully. You use the word plus press blog, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that was a company I started in my early 20s. Um, and uh, yeah, very proud of that as well. Also do a ton of work in the open source, I work with a bunch of folks here, um, contribute back to uh, OpenJS Foundation, Node as much as I can. Uh, and I'm based out of Toronto. Um, in December, I left GitHub to start a new company called Volt. There's some stickers up here if you want them. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Volt uh, later on in the presentation, but you can also check out and sign up uh, to uh, get early access if you want at volt.sh. Um, so the agenda of this talk is basically broken down into two parts. We're going to talk about the current state, uh, which you may know of, uh, about package management um, within JavaScript, and you might know some of the issues that maybe you or your teams are facing. And then we're going to talk about the future state and even maybe some tools that you haven't heard of that exist today. Um, and uh, we're going to learn some scary, interesting things along the way. So uh, hopefully you're excited. Um, I want to start this talk with a quote from Steve Jobs. Has anybody ever seen this quote or heard of this sentiment? Um, he, back in 1997, was quoted uh, as saying, uh, the best, uh, or sorry, the line of code that's the fastest to write, that never breaks, that doesn't need maintenance, is the line you never had to write. And I think that our ecosystem, if you write JavaScript, has like taken this to heart a little bit too far <laughs> in terms of the dependency stack. Um, but it, I, I do think it's true, right? Like uh, leveraging a strong uh, web of trusted dependencies can really alleviate a lot of headaches that you have in writing code yourself. Um, so the results of this obviously are a huge ecosystem. NPM is the largest package registry in the world. Uh, there's over 2.5 million packages there. It sees over uh, uh, 210 billion downloads for those packages every month, which is just insane. Um, so we've been very successful at consuming other people's software and, and not having to uh, you know, repeat ourselves and, and uh, reproduce a lot of the same code. Um, and primarily how we got here, especially in terms of those really large numbers, is actually through transitive dependencies. So um, primarily uh, when you think about you know, your huge node modules folder or the packages and dependencies you're relying upon, there's actually way more. It's an exponential factor, uh, transitive dependencies than direct dependencies. And then this is just a quick diagram of what that means when we say that, if you haven't heard that term before. Um, and actually, we got some data back in 2020 when I was still at GitHub about the actual state of transitive dependencies within uh, GitHub repos. Um, and we calculated that there was, on average, 683 transitive dependencies in, in JavaScript projects on GitHub. Um, when you compare that to pretty much every other uh, language, it's just a crazy number of uh, dependencies that you didn't rely on directly that are coming along for the ride, um, which is kind of scary. Of course, you probably have seen memes as well. If you've been in the industry long enough, you start to make these jokes yourselves. Um, yeah, so you start a small project and then you layer on a whole bunch of olive oil, aka node modules. And of course, the one that kills me all the time is your node modules are like the heaviest thing in the universe. 
uh, which is pretty sad. Um, so one solution that some people have talked to me before, and I've actually seen teams try to implement this, is only to concern themselves with the actual direct dependencies. They're the only things that we, they can control. They know that they can update them. They actually know them by name, right? You know that you rely on React. You know that you rely on uh, Next.js. And so you can easily manage and update those things. Um, unfortunately, it's just it's not uh, it's not reasonable to to take that strategy. Um, it's estimated that there's 75 percent of all the actual vulnerabilities that your code is going to come up against are residing in those transitive dependencies. And unfortunately, year over year, the attacks on the supply chain, the attacks on on your package, uh, the package ecosystem is growing exponentially. So year over year, it's it's grown by 742 percent. What that looks like in a nice graph is this. <laughs> so if you like skateboarding, this is like cool. I got a half pipe, um, and, and it's getting worse. Uh, we're seeing you know hockey stick growth in in this area, and when primarily these issues are arising in transitive dependencies, we really need to think about solutions at that scale. So whose problem is this? You're not going to like the next slide, I'm sure. It's yours, right? Uh, everybody here has felt this, I'm sure. Um, but uh, licensing within open source, if you, hopefully you've read many licenses of open source projects that you consume, um, they're providing you this software as is. And so when we talk about uh, supply chains, when we talk about package management, we really need to think about um, what's the dynamic that we have with the maintainers, quote unquote maintainers, uh, but essentially the creators of the software and, and what are the expectations that we're uh, putting back out there uh, when we are talking about package management tools and solutions. Um, and of course, the entire ecosystem, the industry has moved and pivoted to consuming more open source. 90% of the companies out there, and I think it's larger than this stat, um, use open source. And so really it becomes like a you problem and it becomes like an us problem, right? Uh, so all your teams uh, have, uh, have to worry about you know, uh, supply chain attacks. They have to worry about the state of their dependencies. And I think just to sort of uh, encapsulate this whole train of thought, I think it's because we have a really tough time, uh, both as management, but as teams, as individuals, actually calculating the to total cost of ownership. Um, if you've ever had to do this for anything, um, there's like a quick equation that can help you kind of like visualize this, which is like the purchase price is only like 20% of the whole, right? Like the 80-20 rule. The rest of the cost is actually hidden behind the scenes, right? So you buy a lemon as a car, you're actually going to spend 80% of the, the money that goes totally into that car into maintenance and, and fixes. And when you're actually consuming from open source, that this equation like completely blows out, out of the water uh, because you haven't paid anything for the software. And so 100% of the costs of, uh, of basically consuming from open source are in the maintenance and, and supporting of that software. And it gets, it's sort of getting to, a, I think, a precipice in terms of how developers are looking at, at these problems. Um, they've recently been uh, surveyed, Tide lifted a, sur a survey, and found that up to 50% of teams were uh, spending, sorry, up to, uh, yeah, up to 50% of the time of developers were, were spending on managing tool chains. So they were having to deal with uh, alerts, security alerts, vulnerabilities, having to dive into uh, updating essentially deep tech stacks. And it's like really eating away at actual time uh, building business logic. So what's the role of the package manager in this sort of crazy wild west that we still are in? Um, it's kind of a Swiss army knife and it does a lot of things. If you've uh, use NPM for just installation. You're only using one piece of this Swiss Army knife. Um, but yeah, a, a package manager helps you with discovering packages, authenticating uh, yourself against uh, configured registries, permissioning, building, tooling, testing. Uh, all these capabilities usually come into a package manager. And we think about sort of the larger ecosystem. There's actually a number of tools that have started to uh, get into sort of package management uh, in terms of what they provide as capabilities. So you can see Dependabot and, and Men's Renovate Bot, which you might be using in, in your uh, CI environments, those are helping you sort of manage your dependencies, right? So when we talk about package managers, actually we're sort of expanding the scope of what we mean uh, when we talk about that. Um, of course, I'm going to speak 
primarily to my experience with NPM, since I managed it for three and a half years. Uh, it's also the biggest uh, package manager out there, as, as far as I know. We made up roughly 2% of all the registry traffic in our downloads alone for NPM. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of look at it like this, like NPM is, is definitely the biggest of the Swiss Army knives. Um, so let's look at the good in terms of the current state of package management. So almost all package managers now have the uh, concept of workspaces. You might be using monorepos as the terminology, but uh, basically letting you organize and orchestrate multiple projects in a single repo. And so all of the package managers that are up there um, all support some form of workspaces, which is awesome. And it's pretty easy to find these and, and sort of manage uh, package installations across and updating your uh, dependencies across all these projects. Um, so some of the benefits, obviously, you can run uh, scripts and, and sort of coordinate changes across these projects all in one, which is great for why you might want to use workspaces. It's also easier to do troubleshooting as a maintainer of open source software. It can be a lot easier to do issue triage as well if everything's in one place. Current state of overrides as well. If you've ever used Yarn's uh, resolutions, NPM has overrides. This is also a great you know, benefit. Today, you can essentially use um, a specific field in your package JSON to define essentially a way to resolve your dependency graph uh, different than we would normally. Um, this is a, you know, better, there we go. Getting a lot of tap. Um, so the benefits of this again are you can do specific versioning, patching and forking of dependencies, and you can block bad or, uh, no, or bad known versions of packages. So you can basically take control of how your dependencies are resolving. Um, and again, uh, pretty much every modern uh, package manager has these capabilities now. And what is gaining a lot more traction is of recently PMPM sort of rolled this out is, is the idea of a globally linked uh, global store of packages. And so pretty much every package manager, including NPM this past year, shipped uh, a subset of the capabilities for a linked store um, support this. And it's great in terms of sort of performant installations. If you want to speed up, you have like uh, you don't want to have multiple copies of the same packages. It saves on file system uh, size. It's, it's pretty awesome. And you actually get safer module resolution. There are some downsides in terms of the legacy uh, ecosystem sometimes uh, is expecting uh, your node modules folders to be in certain places. And, and uh, that is both a uh, I think it's safer technically to, to use a global store that's being linked um, uh, just because you really shouldn't be relying on something that you haven't defined as a pen to yourself. So that was the good. Now let's look at the bad of the current state. Um, interoperability. Uh, how many people have tried to migrate from one package manager to another ever? Okay. How many were successful? Somewhat. <laughs> that, that's really sad. Like, I, I think that's a huge issue. Um, most of the package managers that you've heard about ever since NPM in the JS ecosystem have coined themselves as NPM compatible, and it's just not true. Um, and most recently, Bun has done this as well. Their marketing was that they were a drop-in replacement for Node and a drop-in replacement for NPM uh, install. And it's just, it's not true. The capabilities compatibility isn't there. And so it actually takes a lot of work if you want to uh, migrate from one package manager to another, which is super unfortunate. Um, what's the current state of search and discovery? Um, how many people have tried to like find a package on NPM through search? Yeah, most some. Um, have you ever been like confused about the entire UI experience? Like what those little like bars are and the PQM scores? Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. You can say yes. I used to work here. This was my problem at one point. Um, yeah, right now when you go to search, like you have very limited ability to drill into uh, uh, metrics that you might care about for the quality of, or, or just search and discovery is generally um, really limited in terms of finding good packages. So you end up going to Google usually, um, and then you're like, okay, well, I found finally found a great package, and now I have to like just pray that some of the information on this page makes sense, that it's going to be a good 
good package that downloads. A lot of other people are using it, so I should use it, right? Like that's, that's I'm, I, I've done that many times that it's, you know, it's 20 million downloads, it must be a good package, I can install it. Um, at least we're all in it together if we're all doing that. Um, so what's also the state of uh, authentication? Well, if you've run NPM login in the last decade, um, what you might have seen is that it actually generates a auth token in the registry itself. Um, this is good. This is essentially acts as a uh, almost like a session token, um, similar to if you logged into a, a website. Um, and when you actually run log out, it'll remove that just like you would expect a, a session token to uh, be blown away. Um, but you might be surprised by the fact that the token that is created is actually like a published token, which is the most permissive of the token types. Uh, so you get read and write access when you do NPM login. Um, and also it doesn't have an expiry, which is a bit scary. Um, especially when you run login twice and you don't ever run log out, it actually generate will continue to generate tokens without cleaning up the old session tokens. So this uh, is something that I tell folks to please go look at. You might actually have a whole bunch of tokens that are still valid and have not been expired that were all based around uh, login and this flow. Um, this what I consider to be inaccurate usage of, of tokens as, as session tokens. And of course, um, an easy way to figure out if these are web, or sorry, uh, NPM login tokens is their name will start with like an NPM underscore, they won't be named. Uh, and so you'll wanna, wanna delete these. Um, current state of installation, which is probably the biggest area of uh, concern and, and where we spend our, most of our time and what you probably think about when you talk, uh, think about package management. Um, and there's been a recent trend of sort of this no install behavior. Um, originally, Tink um, was a, an experiment that a uh, uh, former NPM engineer worked on. Yarn has a variant of this and Deno and Bun most recently have uh, added basically a no install behavior into the runtimes themselves. Um, and so I like to say this, and I hope this catches on at some point that no install is basically the new serverless. So there's a server somewhere, right? Serverless was just, it's branding. Um, and just like no install, well, you still have to install the packages at some point. They're just making it harder for you to actually find where they're putting them, um, which I actually think is a bad thing. And so when you hear about this behavior, when they say that it's a feature and it's a great capability that they're doing all this work for you automatic, magically, um, just be mindful, it's actually gonna make it harder for you to do introspection, uh, build great, good security, best practices. Um, and have good hygiene around your dependencies if uh, they aren't really making this visible to you. Um, of course, when everybody thinks of npm install, they probably think of, I run the command, magic happens, my files end up on the system, right? Um, and now with this new sort of no install behavior, you know, I run this program, uh, files up on, end up on the system, and then the program is run. Um, so I want to quickly look, show you at least uh, one example that I put together actually for the last uh, open source summit. Um, and things haven't changed. Um, this is a Create React app project where you can see it actually has seven direct dependencies. So these are all things that you might know by name. Um, and I ran essentially a, a test against all the different package managers to, just to give you a sense of sort of what happens when you run install against a standard uh, you know, project. Um, and this is what happens. Um, the number of dependencies varies widely across uh, all the package managers. And this should be really scary to you uh, if you work with teams that might be trying to transition from one package manager to another, or you find that you know people are using different versions of their package manager. Um, this is a huge problem, I think, for the security industry. It's for, for us. We should be mindful that when you say you just ran install with yarn, it's not gonna give you the same packages as if you ran with NPM, et cetera. And so there's a difference of over 850 between the, the largest and the smallest uh, number of packages downloaded. So you might be like, what? <laughs> like, you're, this is crazy, I've never heard of this. This is, this is insane that there's such a difference in the way that these tools interpret my projects and, and the dependency graph. 
And it's because of these things and, and a few more, but package managers take liberties and, and make changes to the way that they behave around different types of dependencies, uh, optional dependencies, peer dependencies, how they implement the overrides uh, features and capabilities we were talking about before. They also may or may not support lifecycle scripts, which opens a whole, uh, whole can of worms in terms of the arbitrary code execution that can happen to install even more packages uh, from one, uh, one package manager to another. There's also a problem here in terms of the package specs itself. Uh, there's non-determinism and sort of mutability in the references we use for uh, packages. So if you've ever seen a package reference that says, you know, PKG at latest, that's referencing essentially a distribution tag. It's not pinned to a specific version, and that is a mutable reference that can change over time. Um, and so there's other ones like that that are even more uh, risky in terms of uh, remote tarball URLs that actually can be found in packages and package references um, that essentially alias, you know, third-party remote packages that might be installed as React or something like that. And this is all uh, 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 supported by every package manager that you have uh, out there today. Um, so it's a bit scary when you think that you could potent potentially be hitting an unknown host uh, or an untrusted host for uh, your software. Um, again, some people say, well, just use a lock file. It should protect you. Unfortunately, lock files aren't completely immutable. And so they do not always reproduce the same installation each time and time again. Um, lock files do not actually store configuration in them. So if you want the same uh, install to happen in your CI, as well as it happened in your development environment, you actually have to pass the same configuration uh, options to uh, that, that environment. Um, and this is something that has bit quite a few people, especially as NPM specifically introduced support for peer dependencies. Um, people found that they could not um, install using NPM CI uh, be with uh, just a lock file alone because we were not storing information about the configuration they used and they would have to continue to pass the flag legacy peer dependencies if they didn't want to uh, install peer adepts. And this kind of exacerbates this whole problem of this inconsistent mutable behavior actually it gets exacerbated by the fact that we don't check in our, our node modules. I'm not, I'm not sure some teams here might be doing that, which amazing if you're doing that. Um, but what you actually end up happening, mostly doing is uh, pushing code minus the node modules into your repository in the cloud. You expect the CI environment then to build and install, and then you have no clue probably what transitive dependencies were installed in that environment and then shipped to production. And so we're really removing ourselves from the problem, which I think is, is kind of scary. Um, and then there's this great meme, life is like an NPM install, you never know what you're gonna get. It's very true and it's, it's sad. Current state of uh, security and auditing tooling within package management is also really poor, unfortunately. I don't mean to be a super big downer, uh, but back in 2021, Danny Rumov did a really good write-up um, about NPM audit and the CV ecosystem that has been built up um, and that's respected by the audit tooling, um, which has just created a ton of noise for maintainers and for our ecosystem. Um, and this is actually a really good read if you get a chance to, if you haven't already, you should read through it. Um, but again, going back to our example, I couldn't even just show you right here that NPM audit, the former tool I used to manage, um, does its best to show you that, you know, you are potentially vulnerable to some um, vulnerabilities. And it says, oh, there's six, you know, high vulnerabilities. Here's an action to take. Here's some automated tool to essentially resolve this. Um, and for the people that know, don't, don't say anything, but does anybody know what happens when you run NPM audit fix? Or can you guess what happens? No, no takers? Fix the issues? Okay. Yeah. Right. That's what should happen. For sure. That's what should happen. And so you're like, okay, cool. I'm going to run the command. And oh, what happened? We actually ended up with exponentially more vulnerabilities than before. 
right? And, and so this is a current behavior that you might have experienced. I'm sure you have run into this before. Um, I did a poll yesterday in a, in a room. Every, pretty much everybody I knew uh, that said they had run NPM install said they got warnings during install, um, but almost none of them said they were able to resolve it with like NPM fix. Uh, our NPM audit fix. And so this is a huge problem. This is the state of the largest package manager in our ecosystem. And it's not alone in terms of the, pro the this problem of trying to navigate updating of dependencies and, and patching dependencies. And of course, like to add insult to injury, NPM shows in the log output, oh, would you like to run NPM audit fix again? And it's like, no, I don't want more vulnerabilities, right? Like it's, it's uh, you know, it's like, stop hitting yourself. This is, this is terrible. So I feel really bad for like new uh, engineers into the ecosystem because they probably run in with these tools and they just are like, I have no clue uh, what's going on here. I have no clue why this is going on. And, I'm, and I even have a hard time reasoning about this. And unfortunately, a lot of people just stay silent and it's, it's becoming a problem. And it's becoming a problem because you're likely to run into uh, a security alert in the next year. It's, it's almost, I can almost assure you with more than 60%, uh, probably 100% accuracy that you're going to run into uh, a vulnerability or alert in your projects within the next year. And it's because we continue to add to the malware advisories, to the, the CV advisories that we have in the database, GitHub's database, um, and there's a few different databases out there. Um, and on a really interesting stat, if you're just thinking that you're in the wrong industry or you're in the wrong room, you're not. JavaScript makes up 80% of the Dependabot alerts on the GitHub platform. So at least you could say, we've got a lot of work to do and you're going you're to be able to be employed for a long period of time because we got a lot of work to do. Um, but it also just shows the, the size and scale of the problem and specifically our, our ecosystem obviously being the largest, that this is truly a, a problem and an area that we should be uh, the ones to pave new paths in. And good example of this as well. This doesn't the the numbers I showed before don't even include um, it, most recently a, a spam attack that happened to the npm ecosystem, where over five hundred thousand packages were added and then removed by the npm team, um, a, like a month or two later. Um, and no, there was no advisories put out for those. So if you happen to accidentally install one of those, um, there just isn't an information out there telling you that you actually have a spam package, which is pretty bad. So we're not even documenting all of the, the issues in the ecosystem. Current state of CI solutions, obviously not much better. We have two of the biggest names, the Penabot and, and Mend. Uh, men's renovate bot. Um, I'm, this is just an example from my own experience. Um, oftentimes I was seeing, you know, 300 um, uh, open pull requests on average, you know, hundreds of open pull requests for updating my dependencies. Um, and this is after being really diligent. My team was a really small team and we had closed 3000 of them. And we just continued to have this backlog of updating dependencies um, and having to manually uh, install PRs. And it's just crazy to think that we're, we're going to have to stay on top of all these pull requests. And on average, we're seeing, you know, somewhere in the range of like four day, or it takes four days to, to actually uh, review a pull request within teams. So these, these, uh, potentially vulnerable unpatched dependencies are sitting there in your backlog and they're just they're just waiting and you're hoping and praying that there's no sort of exploit that happens so the turnaround time is just way too long as well and these are a bunch of the exploits that we've seen uh, talked about quite a lot uh, not just vulnerabilities but there's there's other kind of compromises and most recently I actually uh, put out a blog post about manifest confusion um, which is uh, sort of what I'll dive into uh, next so I've been talking about a lot of bad things take a breath right it's all gonna be okay um, but npm is broken um, fundamentally <laughs> Like absolutely fundamentally, there's a there's a huge problem. I want the JS Party uh, podcast to talk about this blog post I wrote. Um, I tried to advise GitHub about this, and I've been talking with all our security companies. But um, essentially, uh, when you publish a package to npm, when anybody does that, uh, there's a behavior in which you pass both a manifest file, which tells npm about the contents 
uh, or dependencies and all the other information. Um, and then there's the tarball, the actual packed uh, package. And what has been documented and what you've been told for the last decade is that actually the tarballs package JSON gets included in the manifest information. And it does, it does actually do that. If you use one of the package managers, they'll pull out that information and then publish it. Um, but because you can essentially pu publish these two things independently, it actually uh, causes um, a problem with the source, of, true source of, of truth for this information. And so what you get is actually uh, inconsistency between the manifest information and what's actually in your package uh, packages. And so um, it's kind of be like going to the grocery store and going to the checkout, like the automated checkout and saying like, here's my receipt for this like Apple, uh, but really inside the package is a car. And you walk away and you've just stolen like a car. Um, and so really what NPM should be, have been doing this whole time is validating these two things against each other and it hasn't been. And so uh, it's a huge problem. Almost all your caches are, should be invalidated likely. Um, it's a huge problem within the ecosystem that is just, it, it crushes everybody. Um, the other option, instead of just invalidating or validating these two things, um, against each other and throwing at the time of publish, NPM could have also uh, essentially pulled out, extracted the contents like you probably thought it was um, on the server side uh, and then distributing uh, good or bad uh, packages. Um, so this affects everybody. This affects every single uh, security product you probably use uh, because most of them end up using the manifest API um, and not actually pulling down the package and extracting the contents. But unfortunately, all your package managers actually do just that. They pull down the actual package, they use the contents. And so you have this two, uh, two sources of truth that are not, that oftentimes actually are conflicting. Um, there is hope. Um, if you've heard about Socket, socket.dev, um, they actually were one of the first uh, security companies to come up with a, a detection for this. Um, I highly recommend checking out uh, their product. They are one of the few companies that have actually solved this, and I've talked with quite a few very large companies about this. Um, let's quickly talk to you about future state of tooling, because I think I'm running out of time. What, what do I got? Time check? Anybody know? Five minutes? Less, or I'm out of time? Okay, I'll, I will try to go fast, just like this says. Um, future of tooling, right? Everybody's been talking about BUN. Um, well, I can give you some peace of mind. Like I said, it's not a drop-in replacement for NPM or Node. Um, in the last month, there's been over 600 issues filed against BUN, unfortunately. Um, they're taking the approach of really uh, make the tool fast and not necessarily make the tool right. Um, and I really hope that people are, are interested in making tools that are right. Um, so there's this concept of reproducible installations within NPM. Um, I've proposed a new package distributions. Um, uh, conceptually, this would be codifying um, the need for post install scripts. So oftentimes the reason why you actually do see post install scripts is to install some sort of native specific uh, variant of a package, but you can also get even more uh, you know, detailed with this in terms of uh, specific variants that might be pr for production or development, et cetera. And so this is a huge opportunity for us to add a feature, which takes away a, a security risk. And of course, what we're talking about, uh, or what I care about most about is standards and introspection. Uh, and I look at sort of the uh, ecosystem today as kind of like the wild, wild west of, or the browser wars back in the day before we had uh, HTML5 and sort of a standard way of interpreting your HTML documents. We didn't really know how the browsers were handling all these edge cases and errors. And so we need something like that within the package management ecosystem so that you can have safety and confidence that your projects are being installed the same way all over the place. And so that requires uh, essentially codifying and then creating specs for different um, pieces of a package, specifically the package JSON. There's some efforts uh, in this uh, today that are going on. Uh, I'm a part of some efforts in the OpenJS Foundation and, and Node.js uh, working groups. Um, also, we need to essentially codify and, and standardize semantic versioning. Um, because this package specifier needs to be interpreted by all these tools in the same way consistently. 
Um, so again, we go from hopefully a place in the future where you run npm install and the magic happens to a place where you run uh, install and you actually know there's a codified playbook for how to handle um, the resolution of your dependency graph. And then we can have great tools because of that. Um, and specifically one that I created is called, or, or a new language that I, I spec'd out um, is called DSS. It's a dependency selector syntax. It steals from CSS. So if anybody writes CSS here or care or like it, I used to love CSS, um, but uh, essentially this gives you a new expressive way of actually querying your dependency graph. And you can do some amazing things with this. You can create policies, you can do auditing, you can do validation, you can do all the type of sort of linting. Um, and so here's a whole bunch of examples of how you could essentially write a query that does introspection into your uh, dependency graph. And if we added a standard way of creating that graph, then you know, this language could permeate it into, into a whole bunch of tools. So here's some more examples of just how you could find different licenses with the, the query syntax. It uses attribute selectors. So again, if you've seen CSS as a JavaScript developer, this is gonna feel really familiar. And you'll even note that we have like not selectors and has, has isn't even in Firefox yet, as far as I know. So, you know, this this actually launched in NPM and can you, you can use it today. You can run NPM query against your projects today and start actually uh, doing this validation. Um, cool, and actually just like in the DOM, in the browser, we created actually a programmatic way to run those queries uh, via the uh, NPM CLI Arborist rule uh, library. You can run query selector all and pass a selector, which is just amazing. So again, it's NPM query. We're hoping that catches on. There's validation that eventually this will unlock for things like CVs and vulnerabilities. So net new syntax can be invented uh, that looks like pseudo classes, but they become pseudo classes and pseudo states for your, for your packages. And again, if you think of an amazing policy engine, maybe you have JFrog or you have something else today that you're writing really verbose, weird syntax for your policies or your gating installation or warning for your teams. Um, this again is really expressive to essentially write those policies and, and choose um, what you exactly want to happen. And quickly going further, I got one, two slides left. I'm building a new package manager and registry. It's gonna be all of these things and more. Um, if you care about that kind of stuff, if you care about any of these issues. Um, and key takeaways here, uh, I hope that the future is fast, open source, standard, accurate, secure, and hopefully sustainable uh, within package management. And uh, yeah, thank you. I don't, I don't know what we're at at time. Uh, on time. Okay. Three, sorry. Two minutes more. Okay. Well, I could go back to any slide or if somebody has any questions, let me know. Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. I come from JVM world and like, you know, Scala, Java, Haskell, Rust, Python. So it seems to be pretty reasonable, you know, ecosystems. Why is JavaScript so kind of prone to the package manager management problem? Is this the fact that it's moving very fast, that, you know, CI, CD is not as solid? I wonder, what, like, is there difference in culture and uh, like you technical solutions, do they reflect this difference, right? I just want, because like, just to give you an example, right? Like in Java is used in a bunch of banks and people are generally very paranoid. People who use Java like strong types, right? I like strong types. And so like, the attitude, right? Like if you want to sneak a jar in the bank, like you can't use Maven because it's firewalled. Like it will be put in a holding pan and inspected by security. So people around kind of JVM ecosystem, they have this kind of paranoia built in. Maybe that's preventing them from this kind of security exploits. I just wonder what, like, what do you think is kind of cultural traits of JavaScript ecosystem which enable this kind of abuse and which technical solution will attack it in the best way? Sure. 
Uh, I'll answer this one, and then I, I think that's probably all we have time at, uh, for. Uh, I think the biggest reason why culturally and, and within this ecosystem we have this problem is because we pivoted from a package management ecosystem prior to uh, NPM to, uh, that was fully gated. If you ever tried to get your software into a package manager, it was essentially a uh, library that was gated by a few privileged few. And, and in fact, a lot of ecosystems are still like that. And when NPM was introduced, they essentially unlocked the ability for you to distribute through the package manager almost any software. Like the barrier to entry into the JavaScript ecosystem to distribute software is very low. Like you, there's almost very little criteria that you have to, you know, and that's why it's easy to automate attacks like you saw. And so because the barrier to entry is so low, you can essentially automate this. And NPM never built into it any kind of like staging, like two staged um, review process for adding packages into the registry. And so what you get is actually a lot of low quality packages. So that number is nice and big and we can all feel good about it in terms of how many packages are in the ecosystem. But the actual quality of, of a lot of them is probably pretty, pretty low, unfortunately. But that, you know, it's a two-sided, it, there's trade-offs there because you really do want to uh, add mechanisms to allow for people to, to contribute and start to get involved as quickly as possible and not to, to have sort of what we had prior to NPM, which was a lot of gated communities. Um, and, uh, but there's, there's definitely more that could be done. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you folks. And I'll talk to you soon.